Blood transfusions are indicated for a variety of diseases in ruminants, and we perform them most commonly for things like homonchus infestation in sheep and goats, sometimes in alpacas and llamas, uh, anaplasmosis in cattle, and bleeding abomasal ulcers in any of the species. Whole blood transfusions can be performed pretty economically in practice. Uh, some folks kind of shy away from them because they think they're going to be too expensive and often don't um, uh, offer them to clients. But I'm going to show you some ways uh, to make these um, uh fairly economical for most situations. And even a little bit of blood given to a really critical anemic animal can buy it some time to recover. And um, I've seen some pretty miraculous things happen um, after, uh, after blood transfusion. So I'd encourage you to at least consider transfusing patients, even when there seem to be some economic constraints. Hopefully you can pick up some ways here uh, to get these accomplished uh, without too much labor and, and without too much uh, material cost in those times when resources are limited. So let's start out with reviewing the reference ranges uh, for the species that we're talking about, cattle, sheep, goats, llamas, and alpacas. Uh, these reference ranges are going to change just a little bit depending on the reference that you're looking at, but roughly uh, here they are. You're looking at most of our species, the low end of the pack cell volume is going to be, you know, 23, 24 something like that. And the low end of the total protein is going to be about six. And llamas and alpacas uh, can actually be just a hair lower than that. And so, of course, this is the end of the reference range that we're concerned about in this talk about how are we going to replace uh, red blood cells and how are we going to replace proteins. And so below these numbers are what we're going to consider to be anemic or hypoproteinemic. Um, and we'll talk about thresholds um, for transfusion. So at what point are we going to make a decision and how do we go about making that decision about whether or not this animal is just a little bit anemic or a little bit of hypoproteinemic um, versus it needs intervention in the form of blood or plasma. And so, of course, with that, our objective of treatment is going to be to restore tissue oxygenation, maintain their cardiac, uh, cardiac output, and then also maintain oncotic pressure uh, with the protein that they're going to get either in that whole blood um, or in the rare situation where we have plasma available uh, from plasma. So let's review the causes of uh, anemias and hypoproteinemia. So we kind of have a, a little bit better background here about exactly what we're treating and also um, to give you some ideas when you have anemic patients uh, to be thinking about what are your differential diagnoses and what might, might cause this. So I've got these grouped into regenerative and non-regenerative anemia first. Um, the first cause of regenerative anemia is hemorrhage or whole blood loss. Um, so these animals, of course, are going to have pale mucous membranes and they're going to have low total protein. So they're going to be both anemic and hypoproteinemic uh, generally in roughly the same degree. So um, if they're significantly low in red blood cells, you'd expect them to be significantly low in their protein as well. If they're moderately anemic, you'd expect them to be moderately hyperproteinemic. So the, uh, the red blood cells and the protein are um, lost at a relatively consistent rate uh, to each other. So we can have that be internal, some kind of hemoabdomen, hemothorax. Probably the most common cause of hemoabdomen that we see is... Uh, a rupture of the uh, uterine artery after a dystocia. Um, external causes of hemorrhage or whole blood loss. Homonchus, you might think, well, that's actually internal. But if you think about the GI tract, uh, the interior of the GI tract is actually on the outside of the animal. Um, it is outside of the body cavities. And uh, more importantly, when they have homonchus and that blood is drawn into the worm's body, that worm is going to take that blood and exit the body. And so one way to think about regenerative anemia is, does the animal still have the building blocks to make blood back? Uh, 
And with homonchus, they don't because it's exiting the GI tract. Lice certainly can cause regenerative anemia. Again, another external thing. Trauma, bad laceration, post-dehorning, post-castration, anthrax, um, hemorrhagic enteritis, those kinds of things you're going to um, lose out um, on those on the ability to keep those building blocks. And so an internal uh, loss of blood is better than an external loss of blood because you retain those building blocks. An animal with a hemoabdomen, if we can get the bleeding stopped, they're going to pull those uh, pieces of red blood cells back in and they're going to recycle those. So those animals tend to recover faster than those that have an external loss of blood where all those building blocks are gone and they sort of need to start all, all over again from the beginning uh, to build new uh, red blood cells and uh, in cases of uh, in cases like this with whole blood loss, they've got to make all that protein up as well. And so in general, we say that the packed cell volume will return to normal by about five weeks post bleed. And that, of course, is if everything is going fine. We've identified the cause, we've stopped the cause, and this animal is at a nutritional plane uh, where they are able to, I kind of like to say, sort of eat their way out of it. Um, and so we're, uh, that five weeks is assuming that kind of all those stars align. The other major category cause of regenerative anemia is hemolysis. And so when we talked about hemorrhage, whole blood loss, those animals were kind of uniformly pale. These animals can be pink or pale, or sometimes they will have pink, pla excuse me, yellow plasma or mucous membranes. They'll show evidence of icterus. And because these animals are experiencing the lysis of red blood cells, they're going to be releasing bilirubin and we are going to start to see some um, changes indicative of that. Um, and so always be on the lookout uh, for kind of a haze of yellow um, when you see pale mucous membranes to give you an indication that maybe this is more likely to be hemolysis than it is to be uh, just kind of straight hemorrhage. We will see in vitro hemolysis during traumatic sticks, animals wiggling around, it's hard to get blood drawn. Uh, sometimes the just in the needle and syringe, we'll see hemolysis from kind of a traumatic stick. We will also see it occur sometimes in vacutainers, particularly if a small gauge needle is used. Uh, just the, the act of that blood being vacuumed into that tube, or if we allow the syringe plunger to go and let that blood kind of blast down into that tube, we'll see in vitro hemolysis that can throw us off a little bit. Goats actually have very small and very fragile red blood cells. Um, and because of this, uh, you may see in vitro hemolysis happen more often in them, but it also impacts how we actually go about the logistics of doing a pack cell volume on them. And so what happens is because of their small amount of cells, if you only spin them for five minutes, there will be a lot of trapped plasma in between those red blood cells and can falsely elevate their total pack cell volume by 10 to 15 percent over what it should be or what it actually is. Um, and so we, because of that, we recommend that blood, goat blood be spun for a minimum of 10 minutes before you read a pack cell volume on them to make sure that we properly pack those red blood cells and that the plasma is sort of expressed out of that packing. Red blood cell parasites, probably the most common disease cause of hemolysis that we see. So anaplasma marginale, obviously the big one that we see in cattle. Uh, sheep actually do have an anaplasma ovis, but it is considered non-pathogenic. We will see it from time to time as an incidental finding on a CBC with a blood film review. Um, but in, in an immunocompetent animal, uh, we do not consider this to be actually a clinical disease. We do see epirythrozoan or mycoplasma. Um, can affect sheep, 
But the kind of the more famous one, certainly the one that we see a lot more, is the mycoplasma hemolama that affects llamas and alpacas. Um, very serious red blood cell parasite. The, the clinical disease that we see with that is on the order of what we see in anaplasma marginale in cattle. We see less and less of this all the time. Um, the mycoplasma hemolama, just don't see a lot of it anymore, um, but it is around and you will come across cases from time to time. Bacterial causes of hemolysis, Clostridium hemolyticum and Clostridium novii type B, those are the two bacteria that come in after liver flukes have done their damage to the liver and made it anaerobic, and that allows those clostridial organisms to come in and set up shop, and both of those can cause hemolytic disease. Uh, Clostridium hemolyticum is one of the diseases that we refer to as red water. It's bacillary hemoglobinuria. Clostridium novii type B is one called black disease, it's more likely to cause um, acute death versus the hemolyticum. They'll hemo usually be seen hemolyzing, urinating red for a little while before they die. Other things, we certainly do see um, leptospirosis in sheep and goats, Pomona, gripotyphosis, icterohemorrhagiae. We, we will see hemolysis. Uh, there. And then uh, Clostridium perfringens A has actually been reported to cause hemolysis in sheep. By far and away, however, the most common cause of hemolysis that we're going to see, um, especially in the small room, and it's both sheep and goats, it's not just a sheep disease, is copper toxicity. Uh, we see a lot of it from sheep and goats getting access to other species feed, particularly horse, swine, or poultry feed. It'll also occur with cattle feed. And then we'll see it in times where uh, there's been a, a mismix of feed for sheep and goats and too much copper is in there. Other toxicities, onion, brassica, red maple, um, oak toxicity has actually been experimentally induced in goats. Um, at least in my experience, not a very important clinical syndrome. And then certainly nitrate toxicity um, that we will see in cattle can result in hemolysis from that oxidative damage to those red blood cells. Phosphorus deficiency can cause hemolysis. We see that in usually lactating dairy goats. Um, it's also a, a clinical syndrome in dairy cattle that can occur um, when they're uh, making a lot of milk, diet is a little bit um, marginal on phosphorus, and those animals will hemolyze as a result of that phosphorus deficiency. There's also a what I was taught was cold water isoerythrolysis. Um, others call it um, osmotic hemoglobinuria or cold water hemoglobinuria. There's a, several terms out there for this. Um, but I have since learned that the cold part is not necessary. So um, it really has seems to have nothing to do with actually cold water. But remember back that I said that goats had these very osmotically fragile uh, red blood cells. And so we will see this in any species um, particularly in show animals is where I have seen it the most. Um, but because of goats' sensitivity to osmotic changes in their blood, they're the worst about it. And so the typical story that I have encountered is family loads up their show animals, puts them on a trailer, particularly when it's in the heat of the summer. They drive them to the show. They get them unloaded and they put them in their stalls, put a big bucket of water in front of them, and the animal's thirsty because it's hot and they've been on the road, and they go and drink a whole bunch of water out of that bucket and just gorge themselves. Well, of course, that water then is going to be rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream and can then throw the, um, the milliosmoles of the blood off enough to lyse those red blood cells. They're sensitive to that, particularly in goats. And so then you'll get a call from the fairgrounds that says, this, my animal's peeing blood. And you'll go and their urine will be red. So the concern, of course, is, particularly in the sheep and goats, is has this animal 
developed copper toxicity and it just decided to do it right here at the fairgrounds? Or is this osmotic isoerythrolysis? And so um, generally the redness of the urine will disappear within hours in cases of this kind of water intoxication uh, situation. Those animals will be clinically, they'll feel fine. They won't have a fever. Everything else about them is going to be fine. They're just urinating red. Um, but, uh, you know, and then it'll go away within a few hours. And so generally of low concern, and I will just say, I know I've been talking about it a lot in goats, but um, I've absolutely seen it in steers and other animals. Um, it just seems to happen um, in these guys. So kind of have that in the back of your mind. It may not be time to panic. Give them a little, give them a few hours and see if they straighten out. Neonatal isoerythrolysis, of course, we have in our heads because of foals, um, is actually not a uh, recognized, uh, naturally occurring clinical disease in the ruminants. Uh, fortunately, we don't see it. There are a couple of situations where it has historically been reported, one of which is calves born to cows that received the old, old, old version of anaplasmosis vaccine. So we don't see that anymore because we don't have that anaplas vaccine um, on the market. There is also a report of week old baby lambs and kids who were fed or supplemented with cow colostrum developing neonatal isoerythrolysis from this. Um, I can say that a lot of people give cow colostrum to lambs and kids because the they don't have an, another choice. Um, and so what I would say to that is, I think by and large, that is a relatively safe practice. You should use same species colostrum whenever you can, but there is at least this risk that's been reported um, of a problem with cow colostrum fed to lambs and kids. So what about causes of non-regenerative anemia? These tend to be um, either long-term debilita debilitating diseases, nutrient deficiencies, or intrinsic bone marrow disease. With those, um, obviously, the, the most common being these kind of anemia of chronic disease where animals have lymphoma or yonis, uh, chronic abscesses, lung abscesses, liver abscess, hardware abscesses, um, periverticular abscesses, those types of things. Um, anything that is going to drag on an animal for a while is has the potential um, to sort of rob them of what they need to continue to make red, blo red blood cells um, and then cause them to be anemia. Uh, generally, non-regenerative anemias tend to be fairly moderate. So when we think about animals with homonchus um, or an abomasal bleed or something, those animals will crash down. Uh, down to pack cells of 8, 10, and 12 sometimes before they're really recognized clinically. These animals are still going to be up in the 18, 19, 20, maybe a little uh, up to 22. Uh, so they're going to be these mild anemias um, that don't tend to be those ones that often need um, a transfusion unless they've just been allowed to go on uh, for a very long time. As I said, nutrient deficiencies, iron, being an obvious one, uh, copper, cobalt, and others um, can also cause this non-regenerative anemia. Um, intrinsic bone marrow disease, which of course we don't see very often. We can see bracken fern toxicity from time to time in cattle, uh, the geographic distribution um, uh, in, uh, in cattle. Bracken fern has been reported in goats, uh, the toxicity, um, but it doesn't cause them to hemorrhage like it does in cattle. So it's a, a little bit of a different deal there. When we think about um, other bone marrow causes, very rare. Um, myelopthesis is the displacement of hemopoietic bone tissue um, out into the peripheral blood. And so these are just odd things. Chemical exposures can cause these um, in herds that are around industrial areas, um, but we just don't see those very often, fortunately. So looking at some blood work of anemic animals, just to kind of get an idea of what we're looking at, this is a uh, blood work from a goat with homonchus. 
And so it has a hematocrit of 12, again, a very low hematocrit uh, relative, like we talked about with a, it'd be more moderate if it was an anemia of chronic disease or something like that. This, this level um, of the hematocrit is, is going to be consistent um, with hemorrhage or um, homonchus, abomasal ulcer, um, or perhaps copper toxicity, something like that. Um, the total protein, um, 3.8. Think about um, whether or not it's it, good to know when, when you're dealing with a total protein, which you're going to get just off of your um, hand-spun pack cell tube. Uh, there is value in knowing if it is the albumin that's low, if it's the globulin that's low, or both. But you won't get that unless you run a chemistry. And so we can certainly infer some things here. We look at this and we see that the hematocrit is low and that the total protein is proportionately low. So pretty significant anemia, pretty significant hypoproteinemia. Um, it's probably fair just based on those top rows to say this is probably a panhypoproteinemia. It's probably both uh, albumin and globulin that are gone. And sure enough, on the chemistry it is. And this is consistent with what we would see uh, uh, with homonchus versus um, a copper toxic animal. So this happens to be a copper toxicity case where the animal was presented extremely early in the disease condition. Uh, or in the disease course. And so you see on day one, the pack cell volume is 24. This animal's down at the lower end of the reference range, not even really diagnosable at this point as being anemic. However, there are 21 nucleated red blood cells and three plus an isocytosis. An isocytosis, polychromasia, and basophilic stippling indications of regenerative anemia. So when you compare that to the homonchus animal last, you see this animal develops a significant anemia a few days in here, but the total protein is still within the reference range. Initially there, it was a little bit elevated, probably indicating dehydration. And But when you look at that pack cell of 10 and that total protein of 6.8, those are, those are not proportional to each other. That is a severe anemia without a severe hypoproteinemia, and in fact, this animal's serum is red, uh, pink or red. Um, this is an animal who's hemolyzing. Something's happening to the red blood cells, but the total protein is not being lost. So this is not whole blood loss. Certainly, we've all seen these cases of we play guess the pack cell volume. Um, this is blood on an animal with anaplasmosis. They can get down into the single digits and kind of have this Kool-Aid look in blood. Um, and those are certainly going to be circumstances where we need to take a serious look at getting a, um, whole blood into those animals. To go just a little bit further into hypoproteinemia, um, again, I talked about sort of differentiating albumin versus globulin being low. By far and away, the most common cause of um, hypoalbuminemia that we're going to see is going to be uh, as part of panhypoproteinemia, so part of um, kind of whole blood loss, whole protein loss, where they're losing both um, albumin and globulin. Um, edema, spontaneous edema formation will not occur until uh, the albumin level is less than one gram per deciliter. Remember, albumin is the one who's really responsible for holding uh, fluid in the vasculature. And once it drops below one, you're going to begin to have spontaneous edema formation. Hypoglobulinemia, just hypoglobulinemia, here, the most common cause, that this is what we're going to see with our failure of passive transfer of neonates. And so this is where we really would like to be in a situation where we're talking about plasma transfusion because those neonates don't need red blood cells. They really just need antibodies. They need plasma. Um, unfortunately, we often don't have that available, and so we do generally use whole blood to treat um, or to supplement protein for uh, babies with failure or passive transfer. So how are we going to treat anemia and hypoproteinemia going into this um, a bit further? 
Ideally, we're going to use natural colloids. Certainly, we know there have been blood substitutes created and other things like that, but there is nothing quite like getting real whole blood um, into an animal. Um, and so this is always going to be our first choice and frequently actually is our least expensive choice if we've got a donor readily available of the same species. And so what we want to remember is that when we transfuse whole blood, the half-life is going to be about three to five days is what I generally quote across species. Um, and so that's worth keeping in mind when you think about... Um, when it's time to give this transfusion. So an example would be if you have an animal with homonchus that's had, you know, this uh, blood loss that they're very severely anemic, you're going to do a whole blood transfusion and then you're going to kill the worms. Hopefully you can find a drug that will kill the worms. Um, or you have a cow with anaplasmosis, you're going to potentially do a, plas uh, a blood transfusion and then you're going to treat the, the anaplasma. Um, those three to five or so days that they've got those red blood cells are going to keep them alive long enough for the organisms to die and for that animal to start to recover. Versus if you think about a disease like copper toxicity, where that copper is still stored in their liver and they're going to continue to release that with your therapy, those animals are going to need blood over a longer period of time or they're going to be at risk of severe anemia over time. And so you need to have that in the back of your mind about what is the right timing of putting these red blood cells in this animal if I have an ongoing disease process. Um, they're not going to last terribly long. And so do I need to maybe delay a transfusion or do I need to be prepared to do a second transfusion? And then, of course, you begin to have concerns about transfusion reactions. Obviously, in cases of hypoproteinemia, particularly when we talk about most commonly failure passive transfer, having plasma um, available is ideal. Most of us do not store plasma, maybe with the exception of camelids, where it's very readily commercially available. Uh, bovine plasma can be purchased, but it's pretty expensive. Um, and so most people are not going to have plasma available to them. And so in the situations where we need plasma, we are often going to use whole blood as our substitute and the animal is just going to get bonus red blood cells. For cases of hypoproteinemia, we do have synthetic colloids. I want to at least acknowledge those in this talk. There is research using hetastarch and dextran in llamas and sheep. Um, these can be uh, cost prohibitive uh, depending on the size of the animal. If you look here, there are some dilutions that you can do that um, perhaps make it uh, less expensive. Um, and, and these products have their place, um, but we in general are going to prefer the natural colloids. There are some coagulation abnormalities. Um, and some other concerns that we can see with head of starch and dextran, these synthetic colloids. And so um, natural whole blood or plasma is going to be our choice in most situations. So question that I'm often asked is when do we transfuse? What's the number that you use to say this animal needs blood or this one can, can survive without it? And so a couple of ways to think about this is, do you want to look at hard numbers or do you want to talk about clinical signs? And of course, I would argue that you should do both. The, the hard numbers is a difficult one because the severity of the impact of the anemia is um, based on how fast they got there. So if you think about an animal that you cut the milk vein on and they bleed acutely, down to a pack cell of 10, that animal is in major crisis. They have had absolutely no time to adapt to a pack cell that low. And in fact, many of them won't survive down to a pack cell of that low. They will die higher up um, with, uh, at, at higher pack cell volumes. They will become more clinically anemic and it will be more severe because of the severe hypovolemia um, and the rapidity at which they reached that pack cell versus an animal with chronic loss. Uh, 
So perhaps an animal that has a burden of homonchus that is stealing blood over time, those animals can tolerate a lower pack cell volume uh, because they've had some time to kind of get used to being a little hypoxic. And so in those animals where they have an ac- a relatively acute or an acute bleed, we're going to say at 15 to 20, they probably are going to need to have a transfusion. And keep in mind that after they do that bleed, they're going to lose some, obviously, uh, they're losing volume as well. This pack cell volume is based on after the redistribution of fluid occurs. Um, so if you do a pack cell right after they bleed, it may not have had time to actually reduce. And so you've got to use some judgment about what you know about what just happened versus these homonchus animals, um, maybe the copper toxic animals where this um, blood loss occurs slowly over time, red blood cell loss occurs slowly over time. Um, They can oftentimes go down to even down into the single digits and we will see them um, clinically show up. And so we'll, we will transfuse at a little lower level in them often when they, they will be at a lower level when they come into us because they've been able to tolerate that. So I like to use the pack cell in, in conjunction with the clinical signs. So we mentioned about the copper toxic sheep, for example, who is going to continue to lose blood after they first show up to you because they're continuing to hemolyze because of the copper. And we talked about, you know, delaying the decision to transfuse. Well, an example would be they come in one day, pack cell's a little low, but they're fairly stable. And I'm a little nervous about going ahead and transfusing now. I may choose to wait until that animal shows me that he's clinically anemic, where he starts to be tachypnic or his heart rate goes up. Um, Or in the case of a hypoproteinemia case, If I see edema formation, then that's going to push me to get either whole blood or plasma into them. And so I would encourage you to be looking at how does the animal look clinically in addition to what the actual pack cell volume is to decide when it's time to transfuse. If that animal's cardiac output is low, that animal is tachypnic, tachycardic, um, and it is anemic. I'm going to be talking pretty seriously about getting it transfused because it is showing me that it is clinically hypoxic. Another time we may need to transfuse where we maybe only have moderate hypoproteinemia or moderate anemia is if the animal has something else going on where we need to be aggressive with fluids. Uh, If the animal is azotemic or in the case of the copper toxicity, those animals um, that um, hemoglobin becomes nephrotoxic. And so if there's some reason why I'm going to have to aggressively rehydrate this animal or I'm going to have to diurese this animal, even if they only have moderate anemia or moderate hypoproteinemia, I may need to get whole blood or plasma into them in order to be able to uh, not cause spontaneous edema, particularly pulmonary edema, when I deliver my high-volume crystalloids. Just a quick word about whole blood transfusion. Cattle have 11 uh, blood types. Sheep have a few less than that. Goats and camelids have a little less than that. But you can still see the likelihood of you sort of rolling the dice and having a donor who is a match is pretty unlikely. Um, And given that, very infrequently would a ruminant need a second transfusion we very often will give a transfusion without doing a cross match. I think in the situation where you've got a very valuable animal, I think a quick cross match is absolutely indicated. Um, but we are not in a, generally in a situation where we're going to be looking at blood types uh, in order to be able to try to match up donors and recipients. So what about our donors? Um, Most of the time, we're not going to be in a situation where the practice has an in-house donor. Uh, 
Um, sometimes a lot of veterinarians, we use our own personal animals as donors. I've uh, been there before. And um, certainly in my practice, we have donors that are available to us. Most of the time in practice, you're going to be relying on the client to provide their own donor. And so that's a very different situation than what I'm talking about here. This is if you're maintaining your own donors. And from a liability standpoint, I've listed some things here that I think you need to consider um, regarding what they need to be tested for. Uh, BLV, obviously, in cattle, blood transmitted, um, anaplasmosis, uh, um, brucellosis, BVD, these kinds of things that can be transmitted by blood, small ruminant, obviously, caprine arthritis, encephalitis, um, and blood parasites, camelids, mycoplasma, hemolama. Um, if you're going to maintain donor animals uh, long term, I think we, you need to sit down and think about what diseases are the biggest risk in your area and what do we, you want to make sure that you're routinely testing for to make sure that your donors are free. Again, most of the time, you're going to be asking the owner uh, to, to provide you with a donor from the home herd. And that can be challenging, particularly in the situation of the wormy goat herd. You've got this severely anemic goat in front of you. That's a herd problem. And I have often had great difficulty in going into the home herd and finding an animal that is non-anemic to use as the donor. And so that's another concern. Sometimes you end up calling other clients or they end up calling friends um, to bring animals uh, to help donate to the cause. So what about donation amount? You can take up to 20% of the blood volume of your donor um, to provide a transfusion and they will remain stable. Um, we generally do, when we take blood from our donor, we usually replace that with crystalloid fluids. Um, I, in most situations, that is not probably necessary, and certainly there have been plenty of times that I have done that in the field, collected blood in the field, and I have not run a bag of fluids back into the donor or an equal volume to the blood that I took. 20% of blood volume can be a little bit difficult to manage in your head because you're at the blood volume is about 8% of the body weight. And so you're trying to figure out 20% of 8%. Uh, so it is 1.5% of their body weight that you can take. So we're using kilograms and liters as equivalent here. Or even easier than that, about 10 milliliters per kilogram of body weight is what you can take from the donor. And so what you would like to do, obviously, is have a donor that is as heavy or heavier than your recipient. And in the cases where we're doing blood transfusion and failure passive transfer babies, that's not that big a deal. We can get blood from an adult and off we go. Um, and we can take however much we want. As an aside from that, um, I prefer, if at all possible, to not use the dam to provide a transfusion to her own baby and in cases of failure passive transfer. And the reason for that is, is the dam is going to be immunosuppressed right around the time of um, calving, lambing, kidding. Um, and she has just put her immunoglobulins into her colostrum. And so because of that immunosuppression, I would prefer to use another animal in the herd. Now that said, when somebody brings us a sick calf, lamb, or kid, obviously they almost always bring mom with the baby. And so mom is there and she is a convenient sample. But I just want to note that there is something to consider there. And if another adult animal is available, uh, you might want to consider using them. So how much, how do we determine how much the recipient actually needs? So I've given you two uh, formulas here that you probably saw in veterinary school and maybe not since. Uh, the top one is you use when you're treating anemia um, because it uses the pack cell of the donor and the recipient to calculate how, how many liters of whole blood they need. If you're calculating and trying to correct hypoproteinemia, hypoproteinemia 
then the lower formula uses albumin to get you the answer that you want. Um, so the liters of whole blood needed equals the pack cell that you want. So the target, what you're going for. If this animal's 10 and you'd like for it to be 20, the 20 is the pack cell that you want. Minus the pack cell that you have, that would be the pack cell where they are, the 10, over the pack cell volume of the donor. Multiply that by the body weight of the recipient. Multiply that by 0.1 liters per kilogram, um, which is a constant, and that provides you with the liters of whole blood. And then again, you can do that same thing with a different constant uh, when you're looking at the protein portion, albumin portion of the blood. Um, you can work all of that out, and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen if you're going from adult to adult is that you're never going to be able to get enough blood uh, to get the pack cell that you want. And so it's, it's a good exercise to go through to tell you how much um, blood you would really like to have. But what you're going to find often is, again, when you're going from adult to adult, if you're going adult to baby, we don't have these issues. But if you're going from a similar weight animal to a similar weight animal, um, it is it will be very often that you will not be able to take the volume of blood out of your donor that the recipient really needs. And so you just end up sort of maxing out what you can take from the donor, and then that's what the recipient is going to get. Um, in situations of failure of passive transfer, we often, just as a thumb rule, give them 40 milliliters per kilogram of whole blood. If we have plasma available, um, we'll do half of that volume. So what about anticoagulants? Um, if this blood is going to sit for any length of time before the transfusion, um, and this is our preferred anticoagulant, is acid citrate dextrose. And you can purchase these through, uh, purchase this type of bag through a medical supply company. Um, and this is really the only anticoagulant that we have where the blood can sit for a period of time. The other two that I have listed are going to be the blood needs to get in the recipient pretty quickly after it's been collected. So the acid citrate dextrose, um, we use that at a one to four acid citrate dextrose volume to our whole blood volume. So you've calculated how much whole blood you're going to give and then figure out a fourth of that, and that's how much acid citrate dextrose needs to be in your container that you're going to use um, for the transfusion. And we're going to look at the what's available for that next, but you can just buy bags that already have the acid citrate dextrose in them, and then as long as you fill the bag, then you're going to be at the right um, uh, ratio. Sodium citrate is another option that you may come across. Um, typically use, um, is available in two and a half to four percent sodium citrate. And when we use sodium citrate, we use that at a rate of one to nine sodium citrate to whole blood. Um, you can, in a pinch, use heparin. Um, there is a risk that you can heparinize the recipient, that they're going to get enough heparin in them that if if they are predisposed to bleeding or something happens to them, that they're going to start bleeding, particularly maybe even out of your catheter site for the transfusion, um, you run the risk of them having excessive bleeding. Um, if you're going to do it, and this is all you have to try, and I have certainly been in a situation before where I had no other anticoagulant available and I have used heparin, um, you use four and a half to five units per mil of blood that you're transfusing. Again, this would not be a first choice. This is we're trying to save a life and we don't have other options available to us. Um, a memory that I have that I kind of chuckle to myself about heparin transfusions is when I was in private practice, I had a uh, puppy that presented to me for hookworms. I was in a very, very rural area. Puppy had hookworms needed a blood transfusion, gums were white as a sheet. Um, I owned a greyhound at the time, best blood donor ever. Um, and I literally put some heparin in a 60 mil syringe. I drew 60 mils of blood off of my dog 
and I gave it pretty much off the needle to the hookworm puppy um, because we didn't have money available for this case. And uh, the puppy stayed in the cage overnight and we came into the clinic the next morning and opened the front door and the puppy was a black and tan coon hound. And from the front clinic door, we could hear, this puppy had come to life. Um, so, you know, I feel very obligated to tell you that we should be um, using the proper materials and the proper anticoagulants to give blood transfusions. But if something is going to die, um, I think that it is appropriate to um, be resourceful. Um, and so there is how you can do it. So when we're giving um, the transfusion, not off of a 60 mil syringe and a needle, um, we can purchase these bags here on the left that are already prepared. Uh, that little blue thing that you see is a sheath over the bleeding needle. Um, and these uh, bags are great because you can just get your donor, uh, stick your bleeding needle in, and you can fill the bags up. They've already got the anticoagulant in them. And you can get these um, from, I think, 500 mil size all the way up to three liters um, from places like Jorgensen. And they cost $11 up to $20. And so really pretty reasonable when you think about it being a totally contained system and then you just um, are able then to administer it from that same bag. The next picture over is a bleeding trocar. Um, and the, uh, what's above it is the sheath. Um, these are very sharp, high gauge. Um, they're probably, this one laying here is probably a 10 gauge needle. And we like to use those when we're bleeding adult cattle because we can get the volume fast. And if you looked at the left-hand side of that, you can see that it's got um, a, a hub that you can hook onto with like a Bell IV set or a Simplex set type tubing um, or similar tubing that you can use as your tube for bleeding into whatever container it is that you're going to use. Um, but again, these uh, uh, sets where it's all self-contained are really nice. This is next over is a picture of us uh, getting blood from a goat. We've clipped and prepared him. Um, we've placed the bleeding needle um, down towards the heart, heart, and we are occluding the jugular vein, keeping the tube from kinking, and filling our bag from that. And then the next step over is we are weighing the bag periodically. We are also rocking the bag constantly, not shaking, but rocking. And then we will weigh the bag to make sure that we get the volume of blood that we need. Um, real In reality, if you just fill the bag until you think it cannot take one more mil, that's how they're set up. They will be tight like a tick. Um, when you have uh, met the ratio that you need for the anticoagulant that is inside. But if you're not going to use the whole bag or something like that, you can weigh it and know how much volume you've got. You should also use a blood filtration set, which is pictured over here on the left. Um, what this does is this is, has a micro filter in it that takes out any blood clots. Um, I have certainly done transfusions without these. Again, uh, best practice is to use um, a filter set. This picture on the right is transfusing a copper toxic sheep, and you can see the blood filter there in the middle of the right-hand line. He's getting crystalloids on the left. He's getting blood on the right. And if you look up at the top of that, that blood is actually in a glass uh, jar. Um, this picture is, is really old before we really had these nice bags available to us. And so we would actually fill sterilized glass jars. Um, and that's a Bell IV set that's hooked up to it then. And then that goes down into the blood filter. And so we sort of engineered this series of tubing to be able to give this blood. These new bags, as I said, are much more convenient. Here's just a funny one down heifer. She goes down in the chute. She's severely anemic. Um, and if you look at that bottle, that's a moonshine jug. <laughs> and we've taken duct tape and put the three X's on it to mark it as such. Um, again, Bell IV set down out of that into a blood filter and then into a catheter um, in her neck. And so you can get pretty creative 
um, in situations where you don't have all the tools that you need. So the rate that we give blood transfusions, um, we're going to get a catheter placed in the recipient and we're going to figure up our whole blood uh, transfusion rate. And the rate that I like to use is five milliliters per kilogram per hour and give it at that rate for 15 to 20 minutes. And that's a relatively low rate reason we're going to do that is in that first 15 to 20 minutes is when they're going to have a transfusion reaction if they're going to. Uh, in my experience, I've done a fair number of blood transfusions across ruminant species, and I have only ever seen one transfusion reaction, and it was in a goat who had a uh, T-cell lymphoma. And so I believe that that goat was immunologically pretty wound up and therefore was predisposed and set up to have a transfusion. In the vast majority of the situations we're going to be in, uh, we're not going to have that kind of immunologic stimulation going on. So we need to be ready for them, um, but I find that they are quite rare. Once you make it to that 15 or 20 minutes, you've been monitoring heart rate, you've been monitoring mucous membrane, monitoring respiratory rate, you're not seeing any evidence of a reaction, then you can double the rate, go quite a bit faster. Some people at this point will just open it wide open and just let it run. I tend to go ahead and calculate the rate. I'm a little more conservative about that. Um, but many people just open it wide open, let it run as fast as it'll go until the blood is out. Now it is my preference to let the blood run by gravity flow and to control uh, the flow just using my little thumb adjuster on the line rather than to use either a volumetric fluid pump or a syringe pump. And the reason for this is if you look at these numbers, they did a study in dogs where they gave blood through a fluid pump or a syringe pump and you see that four out of eight dogs with the volumetric fluid pump and one out of seven out of the syringe pump, which is shocking, still had transfused red blood cells in the circulation at 24 hours. So these fluid pumps kill off a lot of red blood cells really early on in the process, in 24 hours. Once they made it to 24 hours, the what... What, what cells were still there lived out to a normal lifespan, um, but you can see that your cells really get damaged um, by using these pumps. And so just figure out your rate and run it as a gravity drip um, rather than the fluid pump. Um, it uh, will get you more bang for your buck, uh, it appears, for your blood transfusion. So I wanted to give you a formulary that I use for uh, the drugs that we may need in a situation of a transfusion reaction. These are the dosages that I use in ruminants. Um, again, transfusion reactions have been very rare in my experience, and but the best way to prevent a transfusion reaction is to be ready for it. And so um, keep a formulary uh, by your side. Many people will advocate for giving diphenhydramine or flunixin as a pre-med for transfusion. I think as long as those drugs are not contraindicated in that particular patient, there's no reason not to go ahead and do that. But I do not routinely pre-med uh, for transfusion reactions, but I keep the formulary available, keep the uh, drugs available, and that's the best way to ward one off um, is to make sure that you're well prepared for it. So what about the recovery after transfusion? What should the owner and you expect uh, after that? And so the rapidity with which they will recover is largely related to the mechanism of the edema. So we've talked about the difference between an acute bleed versus a chronic bleed. Um, maybe an animal that is nutritionally deficient and parasitized. It may take them a while to come back until their plane of nutrition uh, gets back to where it needs to be versus maybe an animal who has copper toxicity and is going to continue to hemolyze. That's going to be a little bit of a different recovery there. Whatever comorbidities they have going on, um, uh, 
in addition to what caused their anemia as well as what caused their anemia um, is going to drive how fast their recovery is going to be. And so what I do is I increase their plan of nutrition. I do whatever supportive things are needed for their primary disease. Um, you can supplement them with iron dextran. I'm going to make sure that I get a, a trace mineral in front of them that they want to eat, a loose trace mineral that's got iron in it, but you can do injectable iron dextran. Um, it's only labeled for pigs. The dosage um, that many folks use in small ruminants is a half a mil to one mil. Um, I would uh, encourage you to not give several days of that, maybe give them a couple of days of that just to give them a little bump up in their iron, give them some building blocks to make some red blood cells out of. Um, we do expect the hemoglobin and packed cell volume to return to normal about five weeks after the bleeding episode. Um, and again, that's in ideal conditions where the primary disease process is under control, the comorbidities are under control, and this animal is back to eating and gets back at a good nutritional plane. We may need to give them a little more time than that um, if they have uh, an ongoing disease process going on. So if you're already transfusing patients, I hope that you're able to pick up some additional knowledge here, um, um, some ideas to maybe make it go a little bit more smoothly for you. If you aren't currently doing transfusions, I would really encourage you to give them a try. I think you're going to be thrilled about how with just a little bit of effort and input and, and um, a little bit of cost and supplies, your anemic patients will really, really benefit. Take care. <music>